tonight a massive investment in a Sunshine Coast rail line, but advocates aren't convinced it'll ever leave the station. Another landslide win for Donald Trump in his bid to be the Republican presidential nominee, but his challenger is refusing to bow out. Disability advocates demand government action to make public transport more accessible. And a North Queensland community's push to create a proper resting place for a sex worker brutally murdered in their town 90 years ago. Good evening, Jessica Van Vonderen with ABC News. It's being described as the biggest project of its kind in a generation. The state government's committed more than $2.7 billion towards the direct Sunshine Coast rail line. It'll allow fast travel from Brisbane to the beach by 2032. But the plan's been labelled a funding cut by critics who say it's too little, too late. It's a big ticket item and the state government's finally ready to pay up $2.75 billion to make direct Sunshine Coast rail come to life. This is Brisbane to the beach and Caloundra to the CBD. The heavy rail connections tip to make the trip 45 minutes faster than by car, taking the pressure off a consistently clogged Bruce Highway while accommodating for a rapidly growing population. By 2046, there'll be 600,000 additional people living on the Sunshine Coast. So now is the time for us to deliver this project. Stage one will run from Birwa to Caloundra, but there's no money yet for stage two and three from Caloundra into Maroochydore. That had been part part of the big sell for the 2032 Olympic Games. And to think that we won't have a heavy passenger rail to our city centre is a sick, sad joke. I think it's going to end up somewhat of a national embarrassment with transport to the Olympics. An athlete's satellite village is due to be built in the Maroochydore CBD with events at Alexandra Headland nearby. What are they going to do when the athletes get to Caloundra? Um, you know, they're going to bust them up. The federal government will also need to match the funding of $2.75 billion to ensure Stage 1 to Caloundra can be built by 2032. And this comes at a time when major infrastructure projects are being scrapped due to soaring costs. Well, I'm not confident under the Labor government this will happen at all because we've seen delay, 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 project blowout by project blowout. With our money on the table sends a really clear signal that we want to get this done. Sunshine Coast Direct Rail was first mooted by the state government in the mid-1990s. And, um, yeah, we're, we're still talking about it. So we're absolutely confident that we can make this commitment today to deliver for the people of the Sunshine Coast. Who will be watching and waiting. Construction's not due to begin until 2026. Jessica Ross, ABC News, Maroochydore. Heavy rain in North Queensland has started to ease, but the risk of flash flooding remains. Tully, south of Cairns, recorded more than 400 millimetres over the weekend, cutting off the Bruce Highway. Further south in Urimo, homes and businesses were also impacted by floodwaters. More rain is forecast for central Queensland in coming days. New South Wales detectives looking for the bodies of a missing Sydney couple have expanded their search with divers called in to assist nearly 200 kilometres south of the alleged crime scene. The police commissioner says detectives are working around the clock to find answers and has asked the community for patience. Bag after bag, police collect more evidence from an eastern Sydney home, the scene of an alleged double homicide. Today's seized items fill a car boot, but police still haven't found Jesse Baird and Luke Davies. My wife and I actually ran into uh, Jesse and Luke only a, a week or so ago. I mean, they both seem so happy, um, in love. It was at this terrace, rented by Jesse, that police found a large volume of blood and a bullet on Wednesday. Ballistic testing allegedly revealed it came from a police firearm. 
On Friday, Constable Bolamar Condon, Jesse's ex-boyfriend, turned himself in at Bondi Police Station and was charged with two counts of murder. Detectives say he's offered no assistance in locating the bodies. The investigation has taken police from Sydney up to Newcastle and today they expanded their search south to Goulburn. Questions are expected to be raised about the force's firearms policies and mental health assessments of officers. No doubt that police investigation and subsequent investigations uh, will put forward recommendations if they are needed to change in the way in which uh, we operate in that space. Should it surface that there's additional needs and additional demand, then of course we'll consider that on its merits. Dozens of mourners have left flowers for the couple outside Jesse's home in Paddington. The police commissioner is urging the community to be patient as detectives try to determine exactly what happened to the two young men. This happening right around Mardi Gras when it's a celebration of gay life, it just hits that much harder. The most difficult thing is just to comprehend what has actually happened and especially at the moment as well, uh, not knowing where Jesse and Luke are. A shaken community, desperate for answers. Helena Burke, ABC News, Sydney. Donald Trump is marching towards the Republican nomination for president after a resounding win in his party's fourth nomination contest. The result was declared just minutes after polls closed in South Carolina. His challenger, Nikki Haley, has vowed to stay in the race, but looks unlikely to stop Mr Trump. Please welcome the next president of the United States. Notching up another victory. This was a little sooner than we anticipated. It was an even bigger win than we anticipated. Voters in South Carolina apparently undaunted by the slew of criminal charges the former president is facing. I know where Donald Trump took us in the last four years of his term and decided to go back that direction. So. One exit poll of 2,000 voters here finding more than 60% would still support Mr Trump even if convicted of a crime. With a similar percentage doubting Joe Biden won the previous election. But we're Trump supporters, right? Both of us, yeah. mm -hmm. Always have been? Always have been, yeah. Nikki Haley found some support on her home turf performing a little better than polls had predicted. Yeah, I voted for Nikki Haley. Donald Trump is a crazy person. She's the person for the job. But it wasn't enough. The state's former governor defiant nonetheless. I'm not giving up this fight when a majority of Americans disapprove of both Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Nikki Haley vowing to continue fighting at least until Super Tuesday in early March. So much of that decision is about, you know, what does the money look like? Do you have enough money to keep going? You know, does she feel like she's making an important case? Maybe she's thinking about kind of what's going to happen in 2028 or 2032. Behind the bravado, there's disappointment for Nikki Haley. This loss in her home state, further proof of the grip that Donald Trump has on the Republican Party. Probably time for her to move out. I think it's time for the party to unite. Nikki Haley has done just enough here to fight on a little longer. We love you all. God bless you all. Against what increasingly feels like the inevitability of Donald Trump's nomination. Barbara Miller, ABC News, Charleston, South Carolina. A North Queensland sugar community is banding together to ensure a sex worker murdered 90 years ago is not forgotten. The unsolved 1932 murder of Jean Morris has captured the fascination of historians and locals and a recent ABC documentary about the mafia in North Queensland has reignited interest in the young woman's horrifying death. The town of Ayr is now fundraising for a headstone to mark her burial site. Lying in a tranquil small town cemetery is the body of a forgotten woman who met a violent end. It's the most tragic story I've ever heard of or read. I mean, a woman stabbed 47 times. They were an inch wide and took four inches deep. 19-year-old Jean Morris was a sex worker during the Depression era in North Queensland when she was murdered in her own bed in 1932. 
It's a story which captivated the public for decades, and one that spurred Burdekin local Henry Peterson to fundraise for a headstone for the unmarked grave. And then she was buried and forgotten. The 90-year-old crime remains unsolved to this day. Historians suspect she may have been brought from New South Wales. Her murder linked to an organised crime racket. Her murder really stood out. And again, that, that narrative of the innocent white girl, you know, uh, entangled in this black hand monster, you know, run by Italians who were, you know, experiencing extreme racism. It's believed that Jean Morris's real name was Anna Philomena Morgan and she was only in town for a couple of months. But whatever her true identity, most agree she should be remembered not as a victim, but for her courage in trying times. She was of this world, in this world, and no one even knows her story. She's a human being. She's one of us. She, she was hurt in our town, and I think the town should get behind it. A message echoed by those looking out for sex workers today. I think community attitudes will begin to change and stigma and discrimination will begin to break down. But I think the conversation around Jean Morris is a good place to start. Baz Ruddick, ABC News Air. Big changes could be on the way for our universities. A review has proposed wide-ranging reforms, including more than doubling the number of students on campus. But the government is yet to commit or reveal how it'd pay for it. Jade Smith always loved learning, but grew up thinking the ivory towers of university life were out of reach. The idea of university was something that was really unattainable and quite fantastical to some degree. Um, I didn't know anyone who had been to university. The campuses of the future may not be so lonely. The government's proposing meeting Australia's skills challenges by lifting the number of university places available from 860,000 today to 1.8 million in 2050. In the decades ahead, we need 80% of our workforce, not just to have finished school, but to have gone to uni or to TAFE with equity targets to ensure more new students are from poorer backgrounds, regional areas and First Nations families. We've got to smash down an invisible barrier that stops a lot of kids from poor families and our outer suburbs and the regions from getting a crack at university in the first place. Education charities welcome this, along with potential changes to student debt and extra support to help new students adjust. We'd love to see that sort of support embedded in campus. That is what this is all about. There's plenty of homework to be done to find a way to pay for the 47 recommendations in the 400-page report. This is bigger than one budget. This is a plan not for the next few years but for the next few decades. I think what it really reveals is that higher education in Australia has been chronically underfunded now for decades. While many universities welcomed the plan, a proposal to have the wealthiest campuses pay $5 billion in tax to contribute to less well-off institutions drew an immediate backlash from the leaders who'd be forced to cough up. I think it's odd that the revenue measure would be to tax the universities that have been starved of funding. The system needs more money. Back on campus, Jade Smith is gearing up for her masters and would love to see more inclusive campuses. It's been an incredibly fantastic experience. Sandstone for all. Connor Duffy, ABC News. The body of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has been returned to his mother following his sudden death in prison last week. Family and supporters had been fighting to have his body released, even visiting the remote facility where he died. A spokesperson for Mr Navalny says it's not yet known whether authorities will allow a funeral to be held as people continue to lay flowers at memorials. The politician died of unexplained causes in an Arctic penal colony where he was serving a 30-year prison sentence. US and British forces have carried out airstrikes on more than a dozen Houthi targets in Yemen. The Pentagon says the strikes are directed at underground weapons, missile storage facilities and air defence systems. It's the latest round of fighting against the Iran-backed Houthi group, which continues to attack ships in the Red Sea in support of Palestinians in Gaza. 
Almost daily strikes by the US alone have so far failed to halt the attacks which are disrupting global supply chains. As debate rages across the country over how to tackle Australia's housing affordability problem, rental prices continue to surge. But what sparked the current crisis and are there any signs of improvement? Here's Alan Kohler. Something very significant happened in March 2020. Yes, that's when a virus named SARS-CoV-2 came to town and Australia went into lockdown like most of the world. But something else happened at the same time that, unlike COVID, has not faded. The growth rate of rent across the country went from 2% a year to 9.1%. Why? What happened in March 2020 to cause a rental crisis that's still with us? Well, it was three things, one after the other. First, average household size dropped dramatically because sharehouses virtually disappeared because of COVID. That meant that even as immigration stopped, the need for housing didn't decline. Flatmates.com reports that share housing is bouncing back with an 11.2% lift in membership in the past month. So maybe that will take some pressure off this year. Second, immigration then bounced back dramatically to be double what it was before the pandemic. And third, when interest rates started shooting skywards in 2022, property investors bailed out. That is, negative gearing, deducting mounting losses against other taxable income, wasn't enough to keep them in the game. The result was that the national rental vacancy rate collapsed in March 2020 and didn't recover. And while the national increase in rents last year was 9%, that's just an average. Some suburbs saw truly horrendous increases. The top four suburbs in Australia increased by over 50%. The thing about rent is that it's not what economists call discretionary spending. If you don't pay the rent, you're homeless. Alan Kohler reporting. Well now to tonight's special report and most Australians don't have to think twice about getting from A to B but for people with disability using transport requires meticulous planning and even then things still often go wrong. Advocates are calling for decision makers to make accessibility reforms a priority. I've had trains drive off and been dropped off in a place where it took me three hours to get back home. We feel disrespected. We feel like a second-class citizen. These are stories from people trying to get on with life. The ABC has heard hundreds of accounts from people with disability struggling with transport. They want you to know that it doesn't matter what disability you have, the mode of transport you take or where you live, getting around is harder than it should be. Neil first became a quadruple amputee after contracting meningococcal. Transport's been difficult for Neil to navigate, including on a family trip to Malaysia last year. Halfway through the plane trip, uh, the hostess came up and said, we don't have a... Um, uh, you know, a tube for you to get off the plane. So the option was that I would be carried down the steps. The same thing happened arriving back in Melbourne, only this time safety laws prevented him from being carried off. The family were left on board for two hours after other passengers disembarked as the airport scrambled to find a solution. I was pretty disappointed in the administration. For God's sake, they should have done something quicker about it. In a statement, Melbourne Airport said it has been upgrading its facilities, but admitted more accessibility improvements could be made. Advocates say transport systems as a whole have been letting people with disability down. It fails because there's poor services, there's lack of consistency throughout, not just buses, taxis, aviation, trains. All levels of government hold responsibilities relevant to air travel. Public transport sits with the states and territories, though the federal government sets accessibility legislation for them to follow. A review into the aviation sector is underway, while an audit of public transport accessibility standards is currently with ministers. People with disability want them applied and strengthened. If those standards aren't complied with, 
and not enforce, what's the point of having them? The federal government says there has been improvements in accessibility and investment in recent years, but concedes people with disabilities still face issues. It says it's committed to listening to the experiences of people with disability to further tackle discrimination. Meanwhile, some people with disability are taking matters into their own hands. Oh, so one minute and we're three minutes early. OK, that's cool. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Santiago Velasquez is blind and an electrical engineer. He's created an app he hopes will help. Halo would allow people to notify a bus or train driver about their pick-up and drop-off locations and what supports they have, such as a ramp. That information then goes to the driver via an alert, so the user doesn't have to advocate for themselves. The best impact that we're aiming for with Halo is to give people the ability to do whatever they want, whenever they want. Straight. Straight. Santiago developed the app after a frustrating incident on the way to university. I wasn't able to sit an exam because a bus left my guide dog and I behind. I arrived late, they said, it's too late, you got to repeat this unit, sucks to be you. List. The 27-year-old is in talks about trialling his app. His message to transport services everywhere is simple. Transport should work for everybody, right? That's the whole idea behind it. It's public transport and it shouldn't be hard. In the NRL, the Eels have defeated the Titans in the final game of the pre-season challenge. Players and fans are now looking forward to next Sunday's season opener in Las Vegas. The final trial games before the real deal begins saw experienced players return and the next generation shine. Parramatta's inclusion of Mitch Moses and Clint Gutherson improved the side, holding off a late Titans comeback and scoring five tries to defeat them 26 to 16. That was lovely rugby league by Parramatta. On the other side of the world this morning, English Super League champions the Wigan Warriors defeated NRL Premiers the Penrith Panthers 16 to 12 in the World Cup Challenge in Wigan. Down by four, Penrith's tail and May looked to have snatched the victory in the final seconds, but his try was disallowed, making it the fourth time the Panthers have lost the contest. Back home last night, the St George Illawarra Dragons captain Ben Hunt led his side to its first win under new coach Shane Flanagan, defeating the West Tigers in Mudgee. Hunt's classy stint included two tries in his 62 minutes, adding to the Dragons' convincing 34-18 win. With the pre-season challenge now wrapped up, the NRL season kicks off in Las Vegas next Sunday. Anthea Moody, ABC News. In the Super Rugby Pacific competition, Queensland has won its first game under its new coach against rivals the New South Wales Waratahs. The nine-try match in wet Brisbane conditions was full of highlights, with the lead changing six times in the opening half. The Reds were awarded a penalty try in the 39th minute when Jordan Pattaya was tackled without the ball, giving the hosts a six-point lead going into the break. The Reds maintained pressure and eventually extended the lead with Matt Fesler scoring his second. A late try to the Tars wasn't enough to undo the damage as the Reds claimed the 30 to 22 point victory. The win puts Queensland in fourth place at the end of the competition's first round. The Matildas have all but secured a spot at the Paris Games. After a 3-0 victory over Uzbekistan in their Olympic playoff series, in freezing conditions in Tashkent, the Australians struggled early without injured captain Sam Kerr. Wide with Catley, looks up and crosses. Ford is there and that's three. A late goal-scoring blitz moves the Matildas closer to securing a Paris Games berth in July, having beaten Uzbekistan 3-0 in the first leg of their Olympic playoff series. And the banks have broken and the goals are flooding in. We had to um, have some patience, but this game here was important for us to get a good result to set up the second game, so hopefully more goals than what we had tonight. 
The Matildas will be looking to avoid another slow start, as was in snowy Tashkent, when the sides face off again in a few days. Really should have done better. There were some technical mistakes today, uh, and we need to admit that we left way too many goals on the table today. I mean, we, our conversion rate must have been really bad. In their first match without injured skipper Sam Kerr, the world-class striker's absence was glaring, with Australia kept scoreless for more than an hour. Well, how did that not go in? Debutante Caitlin Torpy wore Kerr's number 20. It belongs to her and no one's going to be taking that from her. Um, but, yeah, hopefully she was OK watching it. Veteran Michelle Heyman stepped up, breaking the deadlock in the 72nd minute. To come on and score a goal, it's a dream come true. Mary Fowler doubled the advantage. Clinical, individual finish. While Caitlin Ford's header sealed the win moments later. <laughs> Australia boasts hosting rights for Wednesday's sold-out Game 2 in Melbourne. I'm really excited. I really enjoy being back home and getting to be with the, the fans and, and have them um, watching us in the stands, so really looking forward to it. Worlds away from frosty Uzbekistan with a sweltering 34 degrees forecast. Chloe Hart, ABC News. Australia has beaten New Zealand by 27 runs in a rain-interrupted game in Auckland to complete a clean sweep of the men's T20 series. Travis Head made 33 as Australia posted 118 off 10.4 overs. New Zealand was chasing a revised victory target of 126 but could only manage 3 for 98. Australia won the series 3-0 and will now prepare for the first test which starts on Thursday. Weather now with Jenny Woodward. And Jenny, was there much rain in the tropics today? Well, Jess, uh, conditions have really eased today. Hello, everyone. Just 5 to 15 millimetres on the Cassowary Coast. But South Park, which is near Richmond, picked up 80 millimetres in a storm. And we've still got moderate flood warnings for the Tully and Murray Rivers. Showery in the southeast today, 25 millimetres at Benoble on the scenic rim. Let's check our photos. And Malcolm watched a red moon rising over Great Keppel Island while the storms were rolling in over Gary. Thanks, Russell. And in the Merry Valley, this little one didn't let a broken arm stop her from doing an early check on her horse. And Vince was out early checking puddles in South Brisbane. Temperatures range from 18 at Applethorpe through 28 this afternoon in Toowoomba, 32 in Cairns, but the hottest 38 at Gas and Thargaminda. A mixed bag in the city today. We had cloud and showers and sunny breaks. Tops of 30 to 31 degrees after a pretty warm night, 23, and currently it's 20. On to the satellite and the remains of ex-cyclone Lincoln are weakening and that cloud links to another system which is over the southeast states. We've got showers persisting in eastern Queensland due to the upper trough, the onshore winds and also that very moist unstable air mass. Temperatures are bouncing around over those southern capitals, 21 tomorrow in Melbourne but some light showers around but then 31 degrees on Tuesday with extreme fire dangers set to return to that state. Sydney can expect a few showers tomorrow and a top of 28 degrees. On to the chart and the showers and storms will persist in the north in that tropical air mass helped by the upper trough system. Some severe cells are possible. Coastal showers will continue with an increase in activity about the central coast and the wet Sundays on Tuesday and Wednesday as the ridge strengthens. Now totals of 50 to 100 millimetres are possible but staying mostly fine and sunny through the southern interior but it will be heating up again ahead of the next trough with a low intensity heat wave possible in the south through the week. Let's check forecasts and we've got those showers and storms north of Mount Isa to Gladstone with some severe cells possible bringing heavy falls to the northern interior. Fine and sunny in the southwest, just the chance of showers and storms over the rest of the interior. Birds fall up to 40 degrees. Sunny on the downs, but there could be a few showers about the southeast coast. We've got a top of 31 in Gympie, 30 for the Sunshine Coast. In Brisbane, some afternoon showers possible, and it's going to be steamy with 32 the top, 33 for Ipswich. On Moreton Bay, winds turning east southeasterly in the morning, seas under a metre, and the showers sticking with us until Wednesday, but then sunny towards the end of the week. And Jess, we're going to start to feel the heat too, up to 37 degrees in Ipswich. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. That is ABC News 2 the moment. Thank you for joining us tonight. You can stay up to date on our website. But for now, from everybody here, have a great night.